Good evening. Thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm actually more curious to know about the therapeutic ramifications of this. Uh, Dr. Streeter, you touched on this, and then Dr. Newberg, you mentioned something right as you were wrapping up. Um, you, you did study with the people perhaps with depression, but you didn't talk about people with damaged brains, for example, from TBI or drug use or um, pharmaceutical poisonings or things like that. And so I'm wondering, from somebody who has damaged, say, GABA receptors, doing the yoga, doing the meditation that may or may not have a correlation with, with raising the GABA in that, um, what are the therapeutic ideas there? Um, that is a good question. Um, there are some neurologic um, restrictions on what people can and cannot do. So from the postures, there are restrictions. There is also, as some people say, chair yoga or modifications that can be done. And then there's also the issue of how much somebody can attend. Um, I like breathing exercises because it gives them something to cue back to. Um, and we use a gong with a high and low pitch to kind of pace people while they're doing the breathing because it's really easy to lose um, attention. Some people say that brain injury people like um, not just the bell but actually verbal instruction, breathe in, breathe out, a little bit more concrete. Um, but it's very helpful for them and they're frequently very anxious. So giving them something to help modulate their anxiety is helpful and a lot of substance abusers use drugs to modulate their anxiety so if you can give them another way to modulate that that's another tool for them to help them stop yes Hi, um michael gross i'm a long time chemistry researcher as well as a long time yoga practitioner and a very fair weather jogger and um, the different modalities of yoga i found are important to complement each other, and they're not equivalent. And I'm just wondering, and also, uh, there's an amplification effect, I think, in doing it as a group. Right. Um, and I'm wondering, in your studies, Dr. Studio, where you did a comparison between a yoga group and a walking group, I think a long-time yoga practitioner um, gets both cardio and strength benefits out of it. And I'm wondering if there are studies that have a more rounded exercise comparative group to compare with the yoga group um, to see whether it is you know the exercise and the uh, reaction to exercise or whether there really is something unique about the yoga practice um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, we love to pick things apart, and I completely agree with you that yoga was designed to do the postures and the breathing so that you then could sit and do the meditation. And there are meditative or concentration aspects of doing the postures or the breathing. So it's, it's, it's hard to pull it apart, and it was designed to do it together. Um, there are different types of yoga. Some are much more aerobic than others. We chose something that there was a book that said this is a hatha yoga as opposed to an ashtanga yoga, which is much more vigorous. Um, so there is a lot of work to be done, and I think it depends on what you, in, in exercise literature, it's what you like that works for you. So if you don't like running, then weightlifting might be better, and it's probably true in yoga. And some people don't like yoga, so they could do something else. But you, but you have to do something that you like to do it. Yes, so do you think, and I guess this is a question for all three of you, um, is there, do you think there's anything particularly unique about yoga, or is it this effect, if you do some physical activity that you like and make it a habit? Um, I, okay, so I know several people who both meditate and run, and they tell me that and I know from my own experience, because I told you I was a runner for many years, that, that qualitatively there's something very different between running and meditating and running and doing yoga. Like there's a different level. Like when I've done uh, running or exercising, I'm worn out. After I do yoga, I'm not worn out. I'm refreshed. So for me, that's, there's a really big difference. And I think there's also a study showing that like it doesn't cause inflammation. Like exercise causes inflammation, whereas yoga does not. So there are qualitative differences between it. So it may just be the exercise component of yoga, but they are qualitatively different. Okay. okay. Uh, can I just also expand oh. on, on the, the discussion about the, the multiple ingredients? I mean, this is, again, this is true a lot 
not only for religious and spiritual practices, but mindfulness. You know, the, the mindfulness programs often incorporate a variety of different elements. Uh, and this is a real challenge for all of us as we start to think about our research going forward. I mean, how much can we tease out those individual elements? Uh, you know, again, you know, when I think about in the context of religion, uh, when people go to church, there may be a lot of different, they, they sing songs, they do communion, they, you know, there's a lot of different, they say prayers. Maybe one of those things is really the most valuable. Maybe you know one of the, some of the things are completely irrelevant, uh, or maybe you need all of them all together. And I think the same is true for yoga or meditation. There could be a lot of different ways of doing different things. And and I think part of our challenge in the next you know what's good is you know, we have jobs for the next twenty years um, at, at trying to explore all the details about how these different things work. That is, you have jobs as long as you can get funding That's for true. your studies. <laughs> Um, we're over here now, I think. And I do appreciate you keeping your uh, questions rather sharp and brief so that we can get to more people. Have you um, done any studies to compare individual yoga practice and group practice? Um, I think that when we design them, we design them for group effect because that's um, an issue. A lot of times they say, well, it's a placebo effect. I don't believe that's true. I think it's an interaction with research staff effect that makes people feel better sometimes. So we design it to be equal to take that out because we're not looking at that as a component of what we're trying to figure out. So you might be correct. We also give everybody homework. So they have the ability to do it both as a group and at home, but we also keep that even because otherwise the group effect becomes a confounding variable. And we're over here, would you we give us, really tell? tell. Yeah. Okay. No, we can't really tell. We haven't looked at it's it. It's the social aspect <laughs> or the physical aspect. Right, we That's a, you have to, you have, well, in the control when we do walking, we have a group effect to control for the social aspect because I think that is a real aspect. And so when you say we have a weightless control, they didn't do anything, you can't tell if it's just that they didn't have any attention. Um, from the people that are doing the study. So we, we control for it, we don't look at it, we try to even it out, because we it's, think there is a difference. It's even more relevant, I think, sometimes in the context, again, in the context of, of uh, you know, people have found a lot of relationship, positive relationships between those people who are religious and, and reductions in depression and anxiety and so forth, but one of the questions then becomes, is, is that just because they have good social support networks that are part of that tradition? Is it something about prayer or meditation practices themselves, you know, what, again, what are the active ingredients that lead to that? Thanks. In the stress and affective or disorder research, there seems to be a large role for the neurotropins in terms of uh, fixing, quote unquote, fixing that. Um, so I'm interested in, in if there's been research in, in yoga and prayer and meditation with neurotropins as a mediator similar to uh, pharmaceuticals or vagal nerve stimulation? I don't think so, but you're right. It probably does need to be looked at. Yeah, I don't, not that I know of. Uh, is, I mean, are there any particular factors that you're talking about or? BDNF particularly. Oh yeah, um, there's been some study, yeah. Yeah, meditation increase and yoga increase BDNF, but. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen, yeah. But that's the one I've really seen much on. I mean, I know yeah, people. And that could be an interesting convergence with some of these pathways. You know, the neuroplasticity, the yeah. the DAT transporters, and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, I think part of the question is going to be, you know, what what's regulating what, and how, you know, what what's influencing what. You know, uh, one of the things on a very obvious level is is when you have a reduction in stress, your cortisol levels. I don't know if we've mentioned cortisol today, but you know, your cortisol levels go down, and that has an influence on on you know other hormones and immune function and you know even down to the genetic level and there's been some studies looking at telomeres and things like that so and as you mentioned i think there, there's been a couple of studies that have been done that have looked at a couple of these uh other uh, other you know, factors that are going on but i don't know if they've really linked everything up to you know why they're if they're increased release decrease or whatever and what kind of impact that would have on on the diseases that uh, that might be associated with them, so it's it's a great question. I mean, I think I think there's still it's something that we'll have to we'll all look into. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, over there. Uh, my question is for Dr. Lazar and Dr. Huber. Uh, Dr. Lazar, when you started defining uh, mindfulness meditation, you said that it is presence, and uh, 
Dr. Newberg, you said that it takes several, sometimes several years uh, in order to see the effects on the brain. Um, we're living in a time where there is a lot of interference. We're together but disconnected, especially uh, through our sm smartphones, social media, etc. What do you think is the effect of whether it's a smartphone, social media technology, virtual reality sometimes, meditation people by virtual reality. Uh, what do you think is their effects on uh, the mindfulness practice or the uh, prayer practice? Uh, what is your opinion? Thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, I think that I mean, I, I, part of the short answer is, is I don't know if anybody's really done a clear, you know, study looking at that relationship. Uh, you know, certainly studies of people <coughs> utilizing those uh, devices, and, you know, have shown effects on, on our, you know, mood, on our ability to process information. Um, so I think that it, it's a good point about the fact that there could be some interaction or relationship between them, um, but I don't know if I've seen anything specifically about, you know, could we then use meditation as a way of helping people kind of deal with some of the adverse at elements of, of, you know, smartphones and, and the technologies. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a good point because I, I don't think that there's been a lot that has been done that has looked at that. Um, but also, I, and I, going back to as you started the question, I also wanted to make a clarification that, that even by doing, you know, even doing a very simple one minute breath work, for example, you can change the way you're reacting. And, uh, but, but then sometimes for you know, the big enlightenment experiences, that, that can be something that takes a long time. But I mean, even you know, very simple and very short based practices seem to be able to have effects pretty quickly. But, um, and there's been a couple of studies showing even like one week of practice can change brain structure. That's always a question I get. Like how much you have to practice to change your brain? Right. You know, we just studied eight weeks because it's a standard uh, class, but there's definitely been, you know, one week can change your brain. And then also just to get your answer to the other answer to your question, back in the time, you know, they didn't even have books back then, right? And then I know, I read this recently that when books first became widespread, there's a lot of people who were like, oh my God, books are horrible because instead of being social, you're off reading books. And of course, then when TV came along, it's, oh, you know, you're not reading books anymore, you're, you know, and so I suspect the same is going to be true. And like, no, we're still being able to meditate, right? And so even though we've had books and TV and movies and everything else, so I'm sure it's impacting us in some way, but I don't think it's going to impact our way. And meditate. actually, and, and I mean, there, and, and as you probably know, I mean, and maybe for everybody else, I mean, there, there are a lot of apps now that are out there to help you yeah. be, you know, do your mind, you know, bing, you know, and then you have to do your mindfulness meditation or something like that, and then it guides you through it. So it actually, we'll have to see, I think, ultimately, how well it can be used to enhance uh, as well as hinder uh, what people can experience. Thank you. Can we go over here? Jonathan. Okay. All right. Don't be shy. All right. All right. Um, so as a uh, non-meditating, non-yoga practicing, non-praying individual, I <laughs> was nevertheless struck by... It's amazing this... you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I was nevertheless struck by some of the similarities between some of the benefits that uh, particularly Dr. Lazar uh, articulated and how I feel, at least, when I engage in my various hobbies, many of which do require a significant degree of uh, sensory awareness and input. And, and similarly, um, some of them are mechanical, and I was struck by similarities with um, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. So um, I, I was kind of wondering, you know, you mentioned that running apparently does not have this effect. Um, is are there other things that do that you know? Well, okay. So again, my friend who I have other friends who are musicians and who meditate. And again, when you do these things, when you you know you get into a flow state, and definitely meditation is a flow state. So there's that overlap, but it's really clear because again, he says, and cause a lot of people say, oh yeah, you know, I don't meditate, but I play an instrument. But again, my friends who are musicians, they say, yeah, it's a really great state. You know, it's in a flow state. But it is still different from meditation. There's something qualitatively different about meditation than, and I can tell you, because again, I exercised for years, and then I started doing yoga, and within three weeks, it's just like, wow, there's something here that's not just exercise for me. And I know, again, same with, with a meditation for a lot of people. It's like, you know, there's something very different in those states. Maybe I should try it. I, I grapple with this, again, in, in, in the work that I do because of the term spirituality. And I get a lot of people who say, you know, my spiritual outlet is music or creativity or hiking or whatever and and it, it, i think 
in a, in a sort of in a, on a more meta level, we, we all need to kind of think a little bit more about what do we mean by these terms. I mean, there's thousands of different ways of meditating. There's thousands of different ways of praying. There's thousands of different ways of being spiritual. Um, and what, you know, how do we define them? Uh, how does each individual define them? And, and if somebody says, I get spiritual when I, when I play the violin, um, is it the same or different when, than somebody who says, I feel spiritual when I'm praying or something? You know, how, how do we kind of make those differentiations? Because I, I agree, I mean, there, oftentimes people will say, no, this is, this is fundamentally different. Uh, other people will say, no, it's not. Um, and, and then the question is, how do we best to try to figure out? That's where maybe some of the imaging might come into play. You know, can we scan somebody who's running and playing the violin and meditating and see where the, where the similarities and the differences are and, and see where some of those end uh, processes are that lead to the experience of whatever it is that the person's doing. Convince me to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our last question here. last on the increased gray matter? And then my follow-up question is, if someone stops meditating, is there a savings effect? Right. So the short answer is we don't know yet because we <laughs> haven't done the experiment yet, but we're doing it now. Um, other people have done things where they taught people how to do something new and they saw a change in their brain and they had them stop. And it goes down pretty quickly. And so, but it doesn't go back down to zero. And so it's sort of like you never forget how to ride a bike. Right, and so and I, if you've ever tried to ride a bike after not riding it for a long time, you know you're a little rusty and it's not quite smooth when you first get on, but then you pick it up again pretty quickly. Same with meditation, I think that, because uh, I know definitely I've gone through periods where I don't practice much, and other periods where I practice a lot, and you know, definitely in the periods where I'm not practicing much, there's definitely some benefits that spill over that I've, I've got, you know, that, because like part of it that happens is you start seeing things in a different way. Right, that's what really, and you just, it's like, you know, once you learn something, you have it, right? And so that doesn't change. But something like the calm and being re not reactive, that wears off. But some of the other benefits of, of like understanding things in a new way, that, that, that's with you. Okay, so that's n equals one, right? So are the right. other data to support that? Uh, you know, that, that yes. the savings are there and the, you know, the, the positive effects? Um, I didn't mean to be rude. But, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if they've actually. So it's certainly with like depression, and anxiety. They've done studies where like they put people through these eight-week programs and they come back and they test them like, you know, but they don't always ask are the people still practicing. But you, know, it does seem like there is some benefits, long-term benefit mm -hmm. from these programs, even if they just stop if they stop practicing. So, but that's more in terms of like the depression, and anxiety. I'd say. Yeah, some of the like the MBSR studies. Would, would come back and follow people a year or two, two years down the road. I think John Kevin didn't publish that data, and yeah, and and found that there was still an effect. But I, I, I don't think I don't. We don't know the exact answer to how long it lasts or how strong of an effect. Uh, e even in the acute, I mean, we haven't really done a lot. Maybe you're doing this now, but where you know if you meditate and now you stop, where what, what's you know, just it's sort of like a like a pharmacokinetic curve that uh, you know we we gotta we gotta look up and figure out. Okay, we're going to break up now and go out and for our reception. And join me again in thanking our speakers.